back to the culture call on Praise 93.3 with L. Spencer Smith. Our desire is to reach and empower the community by discussing a cross section of relevant topics from various perspectives that are essential to its growth and interpersonal connections. Be sure to save our call in number 205 752 4800. Be sure to install the free Praise 93.3 app so you can send L. Spencer Smith a message or topic idea. Search for WTSK in your app store. This is the world great morning, great morning, great morning, precious people. You know what time it is. That's right. It's time for yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on the Culture Call, the place where Tuscaloosa, yeah, meets the world. Listen, for the next two hours, that's right, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we're going to be talking a little bit about what? Everything from society to sports, education to economics, and from religion to relationships. And as always, always family, we are here to create a safe space. That's right, a safe space to have empowering, yeah, provocative, and sometimes controversial conversations. And guess what? You can call in or chat it up with us as we learn together right here on The Culture Call. Listen, you know how we do it every morning. Shout out number one to all of our new listeners. That's right. For those of you who are just here to the CC family for the first time, hey, welcome. It's going to be a wonderful day. We have an exciting time talking and sharing and just learning information uh, that, that you know, the text says, and all you're getting, get an understanding, and that's what I'm here to do. Do my best to give everybody an understanding with truth and integrity and do all that. Yeah, absolutely. So welcome, whether you're at your desk, on vacation, riding through the city, or just doing whatever you got to do. If you're listening to the Culture Call for the first time, I want to extend a hearty welcome to you, you, and most certainly you. Second shout out. Yeah, to all of my faithful, committed, consistent listeners, you listening to me every morning, and I so appreciate it. Listen, when you see me in the street, listen, you give me hugs, you give me dap, you shake my hands, yeah, and uh, tell me that what I'm doing, I'm doing a great job, you learn something, you know, are uh, you roughing it up, folks, fellas, man, listen, I love it, I think I was born to do that, <laughs> absolutely, but thank you so very much for you making us the number one talk show. Hey, and I hope that you stay with me and let's just do number ones all the time. Let's do that, all right? Listen, last but not least, shout out number three, Brother Jay. Absolutely leading us in the morning from 5 a.m. to 10 right here. And he passes me this hot baton and says, son, run on to see what the end is going to be. I love it. My mentor, he's a coach, wise man, a wise, wise man man of integrity, a man of character, and I'm grateful that I am on his team. I'm grateful that we share uh, like-mindedness and that we can push you forward and wake you up. Yeah, give you a jolt of inspiration and insight every morning. So shout out to Brother Jay Long Life to him. Listen, do me a favor. If you've not done it already, take out your smart device. Go ahead, your phone, your iPhone or your uh, your Apple or your Android device, whatever it may be. Yeah, go ahead to the App Store and search out Praise 93.3. That's right, Praise 93.3. There you're going to find our free 99 app. Doesn't cost you a thing. And I need you to download it on your phone. And that way, you'll be able to hear not only the culture call on the go, but all of the amazing program here, programming here at Praise 93.3 and 790 WTSK. You will be able to hear it. And uh, it is our prayer uh, that it will be a blessing to you. You can hear uh, Brother Jay early in the morning, me at around midday, and then Brother Chris and late at night, Sister Darlene, and all of the great programming that we present here, hey, to inspire you, to give you insight, to push you a little bit forward, to make it a better and a positive day. You can get that app, and you can see the news, current events. You know we've got a hurricane coming uh, may have landed already. I haven't checked the weather this morning, but nonetheless, yeah, all of the covering that's happening in Tuscaloosa and the surrounding areas, whether it's, you know, Bama sports, whatever your interest is, you can find it all on that app. So go ahead and do me a favor so that if you're in Dallas, Texas, Miami, Florida, Topeka, Kansas, 
uh, right here in the beautiful city of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Mobile, Montgomery, Birmingham, Huntsville, Gordo, Utah, Reform. That's right. Bola G, does not matter where you are. You can be a part of everything that is happening here at Praise 93.3790 WTSK. Also, email me your public service announcements and events at culturecall.praise at gmail.com. That's culturecall.praise at gmail.com. And give me an opportunity to let Lottie Dottie and everybody know What's happening in your neck of, in neck of woods, in your organization, your church, uh, whether you're a sorority, fraternity, whether you're an artist getting ready to, you know, have a concert or uh, a preacher getting ready to do a revival. God knows we need revival in the land, right? <laughs> yeah, no matter. We want to put some faces in the place so that you will know uh, that what you do is so, so very, very important to the upbuilding of our community. Do you know why? Because we do it better when we do it together. And here is the golden number, 205-752-4800. That's 205-752-4800. You can call in and talk to me, or you definitely, if you're at work and can't do that, you can definitely hit me up on the app. The app has a chat feature. Just go there and send me a message, and I'll read it on the air, and we'll discuss it. You know, you might tell me that I'm doing a good job. You might say to me, hey, you're stinking up the joint. Hey, my feelings are not soft or not fragile. I want you to tell me the truth. Absolutely. But you can do that, all of those things and be a part of the conversation. I definitely, definitely want to hear from you. Follow me. Follow me on Facebook. This morning. That's right. I know you got your phone or your device somewhere around you. All you got to do is go to Facebook, type in the culture call. That's right. The culture call. And you will find that me there. Press that thumb button, the like button, and you will be a follower. That's all I need you to do while you're listening to me. And you can find some amazing things that we do on that page. Hey, maybe you missed the past broadcast. Apple podcast is where we're housing those uh, archived uh, radio uh, shows. I'm telling you, you need to do that. If you miss something, um, especially around this season, election time, all these different kinds of things are going on. Hey, we've got a broadcast just for you. Yeah. And uh, I don't want you to miss it. So go ahead and, and, and follow me. It's just Culture Call on Apple Podcasts. You can do that. Uh, and uh, don't put the there because you won't find me, but Culture Call, and you can explore all of the previous broadcasts that we've had. Listen, do me a favor, sit back and relax. Grab you some coffee. You know how we do it from Maxwell House to Starbucks. Maybe coffee is not your thing. Then get you a little spot of tea. <laughs> That's right. Get you a little cup of tea. Yeah, chamomile if you're trying to calm down. A little green tea if you need a little caffeine kick to make it through lunch. Yeah. And if you don't do coffee tea, we don't do sodas in this part. Too much sugar. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Hey, get you some alkaline or some spring water. Detox that body. Wake those cells up. Get hydrated. And come on, let's get into the culture. Listen, listen, we've had a lot of stuff going on. You know, a lot of people uh, were, were asking me to say some things about the, 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 uh, the past vote that we had on Tuesday. A lot of people were hitting up my line like, Bishop, you're going to say something. Well, of course, I didn't say anything yesterday, and I'm not going to bring up too much about it today, but I will say this. I always will say this, that we have to pay attention. What we need to focus on now is November 5th. We need to focus on November 5th, right? Whether you are for or against the uh, tax referendum for city schools, hey, that vote is passed. We've got to move on, and we've got to, you know, regroup and do whatever you got to do uh to to move forward but now our focus as a community has to be on november 5th and i am praying uh, that you are registered all right let me say it again register to vote if you don't know that or you know somebody that's not or maybe you're over an organization at your church or whatever that is uh your uh whatever that that uh the facilitation that you can do it's voter registration time you can do it online at vote dot org that's v o t e dot o r g you can go to vote dot org and check let me say it again check your registration listen warning always comes before destruction right hear what i'm saying don't wait till november 4th and november 5th to show up at your a polling place and find out that you've been dropped from the roads or whatever right and of course if you've not registered then yeah then let's get you registered vote.org. I had a meeting last night at my church and I told them, listen, we've got to vote like never before. This is a pivotal election 
and uh, a federal election, but not only that, statewide, uh, because those are the things that statewide is is a lot of, if you hear uh, one side saying, well, we're going to move it from the federal level and pass it back to the states, right? That's, that's um, mm, I'm trying to see how, how I can say this. That's the language that they used to use in the 40s, 50s, and the 60s. That's all I'm going to say, right? That's the language, putting it back to the states, putting it back to the states. Look at the condition of the states, especially in the South, right? Especially in the South and the and the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, uh, all those places. Look at what Arkansas, when you pass things to the states, then it doesn't matter who the president is, yeah, or who his cabinet or her cabinet is, whatever, the, the states will do that. It's the governor and all of those state representatives. So you need to look at who's doing what even in our state. So... Yeah, I know we're excited about voting for a particular candidate, but let me say this. We got to do it all the way down the line, right? We've got to send people to Washington who's going to help uh, uh, build and, and push what we want to do, who who we want, you know, the agendas that we are in favor of. You got to do all of that. And again, I'm not telling you who to vote for if you have not registered to vote. <laughs> I'm I'm focusing on that right now. Make sure that you are registered to vote in this upcoming election. Vote.org. Let me say it again. If you are 18, if your children are 18, if you're 18 to 25, do not listen. Don't complain where you've not participated. Don't complain, well, voting don't matter, so I'm not going to vote. That is an idiotic, asinine statement. No, the change that you're living in, you're not in chains right now. You're able to go and do what you want to do uh, as, as, as best as you can do it because somebody voted on your behalf. So our freedom and our liberty, especially as black and brown people in this country, uh, occurred because people voted for the people that, you know, wrote bills and uh, um, put edicts in and, and did different things. So if you don't vote, you get what you get. Don't be mad at police brutality and all that when you don't vote. Don't be upset about, you know, uh, schools and things and you don't vote. Don't be upset about, you know, having to cut your locks off when you go to your job if you don't vote. So here's the deal. I'm telling you, I am telling you that the reason why they uh, fight voting and they have voter suppression operations happening all through the South Alabama included. Yeah, the reason why they have it because they want to stifle the voice of change and transformation and they want their ideology and a small group of people to run the state and run the policies of the state uh, to make it look like what they think uh, the state and this country ought to look like. And you and I are the interruption of that, right? Young people are the interruption of that, right? Because you bring innovation, you bring skill, you bring a skill set and an energy and a vigor and an insight uh, that a lot of times people who are sitting in these chambers do not have. You understand that the average uh, person that sits in Congress now is, is at median around about 65, 70. Right. So they were even born in this generation. They they are just learning how to move to a, a smartphone. They don't even know how to work the technology. And you're going to allow them to adjudicate everything that's happening in the economy, in voting, in uh, in civil rights. Yeah. In the economy, you're going to allow them to do that. No, I hope not. So, again, ma'am, sir, boy, girl, lady, young man, whatever you are. I need you to register to vote. Vote Vote.org. Again, vote, V-O-T-E dot O-R-G, right? All right, let me get off my soapbox for voting for just a minute and tell you what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about uh, morality. You know, we're going to be talking about how we can begin to build upstanding communities. And and again, I I I I, I also almost sound like a broken record, but I don't. I want to get it into you, you know, so that you'll understand um, what we mean. You know, Anatole Rappaport. This is a quote uh, that I was looking at. Re- Anatole Rappaport says this: "The moral development of a civilization is measured by the breadth of its sense of community." Let me say it again: "The moral development of a civilization." is measured by the breadth of its sense of community. Let me tell you what that means. Part of the American dream, you know, this thing they talk about in capitalism, 
that 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 they push out and they get us all to aspire to always promotes even in, even in church always promotes a sense of individualism in other words that it's what you can do for yourself it's about you it's about self this self love self care self thought self perception and although those things are are smart and each and every one of us have a responsibility as singular individuals you know to our to ourselves and our dreams our purposes our visions our you know what what we can do on behalf of our own lives to make our lives better which i think is important because as my grandmama used to say every tub has to sit on its own bottom everybody's got to be responsible for themselves right when you develop that sense of 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 individualism you can lose the context of the neighbor of the community of the person who's sitting next to you and when we understand the quote that we really can't tell about your moral development your character your integrity uh who you really are as an individual if you don't take an account the persons and the uh, and your neighbors or the people who are in proximity to you your family uh your community we can't get a good gauge of that because you're so uh, uh, you know so to yourself so by yourself uh, i think i said on the other day that you go you get go to church don't talk to nobody sit there get your word uh and then he says you know what i send to one i send to all watch as well as pray and then you leave and get in your car you don't you say hi and bye on your way to your vehicle and then you go after church and you don't go to nobody's house you go to a restaurant you sit in the booth by yourself and you're just all to yourself because if i'm by myself i can manage my own news i ain't got to deal with such and so forth well we don't really know what your morality is we don't know what kind of uh, if you're an integral person we don't know what the measure of your character is because that is only discovered when you plug into community so community then helps us develop social and moral skill let me say it again that it is community that helps us develop social and moral skill and i teach that a lot to these young people who that's their mantra i got to i got to protect my peace i got to protect my mind i got to protect my heart i got to protect this and that and although again i understand what you're saying i got to get mine you got to get yours and 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 you know i got a house you get your own house i got food you get your own food i got a car you get your own car and there's no sense of sheltering in the community there's no sense of nourishment or providing for someone's need in the community there's no sense of community transportation because i'm i'm expecting you to be individual and self-centered like me and you got to be careful because when you go after that american dream in that in that if you read the fine print of that american dream context it is a sense of individualism right that you ever heard a self-made millionaire well see absolutely that is it make no sense that makes that whole phrase self-made millionaire is an oxymoron because you can't be a millionaire and you have not interacted with somebody somebody has made you a millionaire you sold a product you you've uh inherited millions right something you have done in society that has garnered you the right to be a millionaire right and so the whole idea of self-made is an affront to the divine characteristics of that us being made in the image of God right and then God didn't do that image in a vacuum in a silo in a in a a uh, a singular location he says that number 1 when he made man in his image and in his likeness he said let us which means god created man in a sense of community right you yourself by yourself have to understand that you are a community body soul and spirit right you're not just your tripart right and so this is important for you to understand that you were built born uh at, at as to experience a sense of community as a matter of fact the height of your humanity and the height of who you are in any realm has to be experienced as you connect to other people as you develop relationships as you begin to explore and understanding the nuances and the tensions between the people that you meet 
right? That's very important because those are the things that help you develop. Those are the things that develop your humanity. Those are the things that develop your spirituality, your finances, you emotionally, right? That is not just the way you feel, but it's also the way others feel as well. And that's how we broaden and gain perspective of life. That's how we begin to understand our responsibility, right? You cannot build community when there is an overwhelming sense of individualism and a a sense of self, right? When you're by yourself, you don't know how you would treat somebody else. When you're by yourself, you don't know how you would handle somebody else. And again, like I said, I tell this generation, they are petrified of getting married petrified of of having a boo, petrified, you know, of X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And I get it. I totally understand. You know, there's some there's some in, crazy individuals out here. There's some interesting. But you know what? When I reflectively look back, those same people were kind of in my generation as well. It is you learning how to engage, you learning how to to know other people so that you will know what is for you and what is not for you. Relationships are is, is are not like uh, you know are not you just waiting on a Santa Claus to put somebody with a bow under your tree and that's your gift. No, relationships are something that is uh, is really broadened the perspectives of your insight. You know, when I met my wife, as we were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, she showed me things. I learned things from her that I didn't know, and she learned some things from me that she didn't that I uh, that she didn't know. I was a part of the band, uh, and we had all, about 300 members at the time. And I was in a section of it about uh, uh, 17 people. You know, we started off more, but I had to learn them, you know, uh, in a, a fraternity. Online, I had uh, fraternity brothers that we were, we were going through the process together. Every place, and, and dare I say even church, which is my wheelhouse, I had to learn how to sometimes divest myself of my own notions and begin to embrace uh, the idea that somebody, yes, somebody else had a perspective. Somebody else had feelings. Somebody else had a, a different way of doing things in a in a way that they viewed, you know, certain things. And so, and guess what I had to do? Accept it, right? One of the the the, the high points in the scriptures in the Bible uh, that we we talk about, is, and Jesus says, "Hey, the whole law is summed up in two things. Number one." is love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, your body, everything. Love God with your everything. That's the individualistic idea. And a lot of people stop right there, even in their salvation, even in their new created life. That's where they stop. I got mine. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my this. I've been, I've been saved all day. I've been, I've been, I've been. And if you're not careful and you don't finish the rest of the text, you will make something good into an idol. You will make something, uh, you will start functioning in the idolatry of self, right? He says, that's the first part. But the second is like the first part. In other words, the same way that you engage yourself in building a relationship with God is the same way that you need to invest yourself in building a relationship. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, Jesus dismantles this whole idea of being coarsely and strictly individual, all right? He annihilates it with that verse. <laughs> he says, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, if you don't love your neighbor, can I tell you what? You don't love you, right? And you don't love you, why? Because you don't really love God, That right? That that whole idea, that let's, let's teach it right if we're going to teach it. Right. He says, start off loving God, because what God will do is teach you how to love yourself and what he made you to be cool. And then Jesus says the second part of that command is likened unto it, likened unto the first, which is love your neighbor like you love yourself. The same way God taught you to love yourself is the same way you should love your neighbor. Right. And so he, he annihilates all of this selfishness. The plane of individualism that can sometimes function in our culture, especially in the American culture, in the American society where it has sometimes delusions of its own grandeur, 
that it's American exceptionalism, American triumphalism, American, we are winners. We ain't no other country like us, this and that. And you can become so individual that you become isolated, right? And it doesn't matter to you what's going on with anybody else, not even understanding that you may need, you may need somebody, right? Bill Withers said it, it, you know, a long time ago when he wrote the song Lean On Me, you, we all need what? Somebody to lean on. Everybody needs somebody to lean on. Call on me, brother, when you need a hand. Yeah. I, 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 you, you know, you might have a problem that I, I might have a problem. You, you know, have a, that you don't understand or whatever. Or you might have a problem you don't understand or whatever this song is. I can't get the lyrics right this morning, but you got what I'm saying. How about that, <laughs> right? And so that that whole idea. I don't want us culture call family to get trapped in the idea of having the American dream and I got to offer myself. I'm saved myself. I go to work for myself. I'm fine all by myself. I can do bad all by myself. I can be happy all by myself. And there is, there is a, a, a context again of which I understand because there has to be a sense of centeredness. Let me say it again. There has to be a sense of centeredness, of self-centeredness that you know that you're not just allowing others to define who you are because you've had no level of self definition you've had you've not encountered the divine you've not encountered yourself to be able to say this is who I am and this is what I present to the world and so that's a dangerous place to be when you don't know you and you don't love you then you're depending on somebody for something uh that you should do for yourself that's not what I'm talking about no what I'm saying is that you know who you are but you are exclusive just to you. You're not sharing who you are. You're not allowing other people to embrace who you are, and you're not embracing others. That is antithetical to human life, right? That animals in nature do community. Uh, they have prides uh, for lions, right? <laughs> you know, and then and then you know you got the, the cows and all these different kinds of things. Look look at nature. Birds flock together. Birds of a feather, what? Flock together. We say it as a, sometimes a negative adage, but but you're, you're, you're teaching a very uh, a different lesson there is that animals in nature have community. When God said it is not good for man to be alone, yes, that um, he was saying, yeah, everything else has something to reproduce after its kind. So let me give this man and pull out of him because man at the beginning was all one. Male and female created he them. He was all one. But when he formed him out of the dust of the earth, uh, that man showed up as one. God says, no, let me put him to sleep and pull out the aspect. He pulled out the fee, uh, uh, the female out of the male. He pulled the woman out of the singular man, right? And the, and the scripture says the two became one. The two became community, right? Because I don't know how I really would treat anybody unless I'm what? With somebody. And so when we, what we're talking about today is this whole idea of finding ourselves in our community. What does it mean? Finding morality, finding integrity, finding those things that I think that we have lost in the American fabric because we're listening to all of these ideologues. We're listening to all of these people spew hatred. You know, uh, uh, you know, for I, I've never been to Haiti, um, but I'm a part of the Haitian community. I'm, you know why? Because I'm human. You know, and anyone that comes or anything that comes to divide, the Bible says, Paul says in Romans 16, I think it's verse 17, mark that man. Mark that one that calls division. You got to mark that. That one that wants you to hate. That one that wants you to to spew uh, violent and vitriol against somebody as if they are subhuman. And so you can't figure out who you really are until you are a part of community. And that's right or wrong, right, good or evil, whatever. You can't discover that without community. And that's what we're going to be talking about today on the Culture Call. Listen, it's going to be a good, good old conversation. I got some things to say, but I need you to keep it right here on the Culture Call. 
And we are back right here on the Culture Call with your shoe else. No disrespect, praise 93.3, 790 WTSK. I'm telling you, we're having an amazing day and a great conversation. Talking about morality and community integrity. How can we rebuild? How can we advance who we are as a community? I think that's very important. So much is going on, you know. Um, I hear a whole lot of people complaining about what's not happening and what's not going on and what's going on wrong and X, Y, Z, A, B, C. I mean, they are upset about, you know, uh, this happening and where all the violence is coming from and where all this is coming from and all that coming from. And I like to tell them, I said, well, the issue is, is that that we have fostered in such a sense of individualism that we don't even think about our community anymore. And, you know, and that's a sad thing. It is. It's a sad thing because what we do is we try to place blame on other people. These folks are doing this. These folks are not doing that. Next Y, Z, A, B, C. When in fact, we need to get back to the brass tacks and the base understanding of who people are as, yes, individuals and how they plug that person into the community, you know, that one of the things that when I was in school and in, in grade school, and I'm sure most of you are listening to me, remember this, they had a good citizenship award. In other words, your teacher would look to see how you got along with everybody, to see how you interacted socially with your other classmates and other students, with teachers, how respectful you were. And at the end of the year, they would measure that and give you what they called a good citizen award. Here it is. I want to say this very pointedly. I don't think we are teaching our children and our teenagers and people in general how to be good citizens, especially as we live in this digital social media age. I think people have lost the sense of being respectful. People have lost the sense of honoring each other or basically this. They've they've, uh, missed the sense of really uh, 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 treating each other neighborly, right? To to considering people's feelings. You know, I was uh, looking at what is the Instagram on the other day, and uh, uh, you know, I was looking at somebody's post, and it was a great, great post. And you know, I was just led to read the comments because sometimes I don't. I read the comments, sometimes I don't. It depends on what the nature of the conversation is. And I looked down down in the comment section, y'all, and guess what? I mean, it was so negative. Well, you don't have to, you didn't this. And I mean, they begin to talk about the person, how the person looked, how the person, you know, did this and that and all that. And I'm like, you know, you are determined to come up with, listen, you've got to be some kind of, uh, of, 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 of daft mindedness, debilitated in mind and mentality for someone to say something positive And then you go to comment under something so very negative, right? And, you know, where you should tell your forehead that, or you should say that, watch how by your nose so big. I mean, really? That's, and, and people think it's funny. They think it's comical because part of, part of the thing that uh, we, we, we can say about black people is we always know how to laugh, right? And I, you know, I don't think it's funny. I didn't think it was funny. I was just like, you just ruined somebody's day to, for what? for what measure, right? That's not good citizenship. That's not good morals. Uh, that's not walking in a space of integrity and good character, right? But 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 I have to stop and I have to stop and ask myself the question, is that, Coach call the norm of the day? Is it? Is it the norm of the day that we just, you know, insult people, that we don't care how people feel? You don't, you know, we, we're not empathetic. We don't embrace each other. Uh, we don't, move in a sense of compassion uh we don't move in a sense of grace and 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 favoring other people caring about the things of others bearing the infirmities of those around us who find themselves in a place where they can't make it uh, is that still a part and etched uh a uh, 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 teaching within us and and dare i say unfortunately that generation is dying that generation is getting older and they're leaving the earth that that did that, right? That that used to do that to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, and all those different kinds of things, and good morning when you walk into a room. How are you doing? You know, and not just sitting down, plopping down, and and you're like hello, hello, you ain't saying nothing to me. You know, we, we, you know, that's the kind of attitude that these young people have even now. You know, now not to say that they are re- disrespectful 
by, uh, uh, you know, and not, uh, you know, because sometimes that's in pockets and then there are respect for young people. But by and large, that kind of etiquette, if we can say that, that kind of citizenry is is dying off and fading into the sun of a new generation that is really selfish. It is. And, and when I say the generational is selfish, I'm not just talking about young folks. I'm not talking about Generation X or Alpha. I'm talking about it's it's gleaning off on some older people who weren't respectful when they were children. And now they're like in their 30s and 40s. And they're becoming parents and grandparents now. And they're not requiring their children or their grandchildren to even show any form of respect and watch this word, honor, right? No, no kind of ideal of citizenry. And so, yeah, what are we going, what are we doing in a country that promotes a man who is a felon, but not just a felon before he got, you know, was, uh, got indicted and convicted? I mean, making fun of handicapped people, making, you know, calling women out of their names. And then you got a group of people sitting behind you laughing as if this is comedy. No, you're trying to be the president. And, you you, you know, castigating them, insulting people. He's a walking insult himself. Right. And and that's what that's the kind of person that we want to lead. Now, let me tell you what the problem with that is. And I'm going to get off of this really, I'm going to hit it and I'm going to get off of it, right? That the, if, if we believe the scripture, let me say this, then, then Psalm, what is, believe, 133 says, oh, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There it is, community. Watch this. And it says that it, it, that, that whole thing, the oil, it is like the oil that flows from Aaron's head, uh, from his beard down to the skirt, right? Which means that whatever is flowing on the leader, flows on the people. Now, what are you trying to say? You got to be careful who you put to be the leader of the country, of the church, of the organizations that you are a part of. You know why? Because whatever is on them will flow down to you. That's the principle, right? It matters who your pastor is. It matters who your boss is. It matters, watch this, who your president is. It matters who your mayor is. It matters who your governor is. Right? It matters who the teacher is. Because whatever they are is what's going to flow down and trickle down to the classroom, to the people in the country, to the people in the state, to the people in the city. Y'all see where I'm going? To the people in your organization, to the people in the church. Exactly. And so you've got to begin, you know, one of the things that, I, you know, uh, I, I enjoyed this past week was my pastor celebration. One of the things that I enjoyed was to hear men say, to hear men say that they've learned how to treat their wives because of how I treat my wife. They learned how to treat their family because of how I treat my family. They learned how to walk as men because how they looked at me walking as a man. That was for me, for me, bar the gifts and the other accolades of all the things that, you know, these past 28 years I've done. That to me was the apex of the compliments because who who is over you is what flows becomes your characteristic. And so, again, I'm going I'm not going to get back on my voting, but I want to show you that perspective. That individual, that individual is what becomes the spirit of the country. Right. That's why that's why you felt a sense of post-racial feeling after Barack Obama was the president because that's who he is. He is a product of a biracial uh, union. And his whole notion, yes, he was a black man empowered in the black community, right? But he had a sense of the American family, that I want to be a president for everybody. So you felt that. And then you moved from that and you allowed someone who was adjudicated in the 70s along with his father for disallowing black people being in his apartment, renting out of his apartment. You you put a, a, an entertainer, a showman person, a person who was on reality TV, all of that. And then you're uncovering, we've uncovered all these other things that we're a part of. 
And then there is a part of the country that says, give us that again. Are you serious? He was convicted for raping a woman. He was convicted for, you know, in financial, financial impropriety. His businesses have been bankrupt. All of that, et cetera. I mean, it's from the, the water, bankrupt, the university, bankrupt, the stakes, bankrupt, casinos, bankrupt, everything. And you say, uh, and people in the country say, millions of people, by the way, say that this is what we want again. You know why? Because that that is who they are. That is the spirit that will flow all on the country. And I don't know about you, but I don't want icky oil on me. Well, now, come on. I don't want any kind of icky oil. Put some, put, put some. It is amazing. It is amazing that, that, that we, we don't understand that context. That's why we tell, uh, you know, the, the text tells us that you got to be careful because evil communications, bad relationships corrupt good manners. When you hang around bad folks, that they'll corrupt even the good you know to do because they have a way of getting on you. And sticking on you, right? When 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 we don't expose bad elements, we, whether it's our child or our neighbor's child or whatever, bad elements in the community, and we don't do something about that, that they become the pervasion in the community. And now, yeah, what was a safe community, now we can't even sit on the front porch because we've allowed that to be the defining element of the community, period. And so when we talk about community, I, I agree with Anatole Rappaport that the moral development of a civilization is measured by the breadth of its sense of community. What do we want for our communities? You know, what do we want for our, our children to be, our homes to be safe? What, right? That's why we say we don't want that kind of police officer in our community. They have no understanding. They might know and actually, they don't know the law, even though they've gone to the academy. <laughs> they don't know what the law is. The lawyer knows what the law is, <laughs> right? Right? But most of us, a lot of times, we don't even make it that far. Because you don't understand the context of our community. You don't understand the, 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 the height, the lift, the breadth, the depth of who we are as community people. That part. And when you don't understand that, and then there is no understanding there, then we find certain elements come in. And we're seeing it all culture call, culture call. We are seeing it all over the all over the world. All definitely in the United States. That even on yesterday, uh Representative Clay Higgins, uh it, it Higgins rather from Louisiana, just went on a racial diatribe, a racial rant for, about Haitians. That have already, number one, been proving that as a lie. Already been proven conclusively untrue by the governor, by the mayor, by the people of the city of Springfield. And, but he, I mean, he went on a racial diatribe. You all the way in Louisiana. I'm, I'm sure the folks in Louisiana that you represent have some things that need to be done, but he had to get that, he had to get that thing that he's under that oil. He's under that, he's under that, that kind of, you know, connection, that MAGA connection. He's under that ideology. Right? And when, uh, when the Congressional Back Caucus, the members thereof, uh, got on the floor of the Congress and said, hey, we need him to go ahead and delete that and apologize. Or he needs to be censored. Because he's not just representing his, his racism himself. He's representing an institution of the country. That part. See, that is the thing that we have to start understanding, Coach Call. It ain't just you in this. It ain't just you. God didn't design it just to be your way, what you think. No, we live, move, and breathe out of a sense of connection. Right? We live, move, and breathe out of a sense of connection. And if we don't, if we don't profoundly uh, uh, move within that sense of connection, guess what's going to happen? We will become eventually, gradually, like the people that we said we don't want to be like. That's what's happening to our children. That's what's happening to our teenagers, our young people. They're on this, you know, I, I fuss at my, my, my children. So listen, y'all need to come off of that. 
Instagram, come off of that TikTok, come off of that social media because these people are gaining money playing on your insecurities. That's not who they are. That is not who they are. They are lying to you. They are cosplaying certain things so that you'll have a set mind. Now you're looking at your life like you're doing so bad because they're lying about doing good in their own lives. Get off of that because they, it's not just what you're seeing. It's also what they're imparting into you. You then begin to gain their perspective that social media is a place where where agreements assemble. And, and a lot of times those agreements are unhealthy. A lot of times, right? I found out that my Facebook post started being uh, shadow banned. <laughs> and what is shadow ban? They started stopping, slowing down the algorithm of my post because I was telling the truth about racism, telling the truth about the evangel traditional evangelical church and fundamentalism as it relates to where we stand now. I started telling the truth about the black church. I started telling the truth about America. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was getting 100 posts uh, you know, reposts and likes on my post. And then all of a sudden, only two and three people seen it. I was like, what's going on? And I started researching. Yeah, I was shadow banned. And folks said, yeah, Bishop, you shadow banned because you come on here and just lay folks out. And I don't talk about anybody personally. I talk about the history and the concept. That's all I do. You know, I do what I do. You know, uh, if you talk to me, you're going to get the same thing. You know? And whenever I post, you know, I post something for my birthday the other week and the numbers were so high. Everybody saw it. Everybody's still seeing it today. And my birthday was last week, Wednesday. And the the post that I put yesterday, it's like ain't nobody ever seen it. And I'm like, really? That's what we're doing? But they, 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 they want to, they, 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 they want to, they'll stifle truth because they understand that these places are, are, are forums of agreement. Right. And the and the, t and the text says, uh, how can two work together? Not can two work together. I mean, no, not not how can, but can two work together, except they agree. In other words, the only reason why these two people working together is because they are in agreement. And your life, my life, our lives were designed to formulate agreement, agreement with somebody. I hope you're not hanging around people that you don't agree with. And when I'm talking about agree with, I'm talking about to the essence. I'm not talking about an opinion over a matter. I'm talking about the essence of where we're going directionally. Because all of us could be going the same way, but there might be some agree disagreements. My wife and I don't agree all the time, but we have the same purpose and the same uh, uh, the same way, place that we're going at the same time, you know, uh, together. And that's what the text is saying. It's not talking about you walking together and y'all have a trouble over whether somebody likes red or somebody likes blue. No, no. But at the essence of everything, who you are as people, you can't really walk together except there is an established agreement. And so you got to pay attention, culture call, who you are walking with, because that speaks a lot about your morals and your integrity. Listen, I need you to keep it right here, get you something to drink. This is yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on the Culture Call. Praise 93.3 FM 790 WTSK. Be right here. We are back on the Culture Call. It's the top of the hour, 11 a.m. and some change right here on Praise 93.3 FM and 790 WTSK. And we have been having a great, great day. Want to send a shout out to all of our second hour listeners. Maybe this is your hour to listen. You were busy at the 10 to 11. Now you're here from the 11 to 12. Welcome. So glad and grateful for each and every one of you on this morning. Glad that you are joining us. If you have uh, started listening to us at the 11 o'clock hour, we've been talking about morals and integrity and building our community. Why it is so very important. We're doing a deep dive into that, uh, not just in our local community, but in our American community, in the human community. It's very important for us to do that. Listen, want to definitely remind you uh, to pay attention to the cash codes. Don't miss out on your money. Maybe the Lord might be trying to bless you, but you got to get that cash code number and do what the instructions tell you to do. So don't miss that. Absolutely not. Don't do it. Listen, also, again, I want to step on my soapbox again. If you have not done so already, 
Go ahead. November 5th is right around the corner. Voting season is here. Go to vote.org and go ahead and make sure your registration is in the right place. Make sure that you've got all of what you need and and uh, uh, get your young people out. Get everyone new to the process. If you've been wanting to say, but I'm not going to vote, folks, somebody else pick it. Come on. Come on. We don't have time for deep, deep state conspiracies because if there was one, you would know it anyway. You're not even in a place to be knowing deep, deep sea, you know, deep states conspiracy theories you would listen that kind of information like my granddaddy said don't even come before us that such knowledge is too wonderful for us as david would say right in the scripture and so forget about all of that go ahead and register you and your cynical self (laughs) yes join me in my optimistic self and register to vote things can't change until you allow it to hear your voice and your voice is your vote. Go to vote.org. That's right. Simply go to vote.org. And they, you can handle your business there in terms of voter registration, checking out where your polling places will be, all of that. You've got to do it because they're purging, they're purging, they're purging voter rolls. Make sure your name is not on it. Let me say that one more time. Make sure that your name is not on on the purge list make sure your name is signed up you know just like you know for the christian jubilee (laughs) make sure that your name is signed up on the voting rolls so that you can be a participant in the november 5th election and not just the federal level but all down the state level i need you ma'am need you sir to do that would you do that for me please yes i know you will god bless you you and most certainly you listen we have been talking about uh, a, the, a quote here that says the moral development of a civilization is measured by the breadth of its sense of community. In other words, we're tackling uh, and we're confronting this whole sense of American individuality, this individualism that often marks the American dream and the American ideal and how we can combat that, how that is, first of all, antithetical to our humanity and what uh, divine scriptures tell us uh, about who, how God has created us to live and exist in communities. That yes, there is a, a portion of self fulfillment, self health, self understanding that must be garnered uh, from an individual. However, your whole self must need be brought into a place called what community, and that community is our neighborhood, it's our family, it's relationship. It's in this whole sense of Americana. You know, one of the one of the things that uh, Martin Luther King used to always, Junior used to always talk about was this sense of beloved, a beloved community, a beloved community where uh, at his time that people would be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. And, you know, America has been fighting that battle um, uh, of, of moving beyond race and color uh, and, and all of those different kinds of things to understand and embrace the beloved community. That's this country's um, ideal, a notion, whether it was too much for a young country to to bear, yet and still it has become its mantra over its uh, over its over uh, what almost 300 years now. Uh, it's it's important for us to understand that that yes, yellow, black, and white, and you are precious in his sight. Hispanic. You know, whatever ethnicity, you know, race and all those things are social constructs uh, that were developed in Europe um, to give justification of of slavery and superiority from the Portuguese uh, in the 1400s when they first went to Africa and they saw African bodies and African wealth as commodities um, to be sold. And and so they created in Europe in, in Europe started, you know, started spreading over Europe. These whole ideas of going to Africa and mining and raiding that country. That is that is the center of civilization. It is the place where the diamonds, the gold. It is the place where all of the cobalt, all of the things that are happening right now. They're still uh, in Western countries, still fighting to have control over Africa because, again, it is the seat of wealth, not just uh, uh, of its resources and its minerals, but of its people. And uh, 
And so race was a construct to show divine superiority between the oppressor and the oppressed, that the Portuguese and the Europeans, the Spanish and all those people were trying to create distanciation. And so what they did, y'all, is first they created the idea of blackness and then they relegated certain definitions to blackness. And then after they created blackness, then they created whiteness. So whiteness is an offspring of blackness. And so bl whiteness was the antithesis of what they said blackness was, right? So to be white, right, to be white in their mindset was to be all things pure and all that. And so that's where this separation starts. It's not organic to humanity. It's not biblical, you know. Um, it's not religious. And they added religious context because they like what God said. God said we can. God, God ordained for these people to be better than other people. When biblically you can't find that, scripturally you can't find that. Uh, um, you know that's just not what he said. Every, he said all everyone is created in my image and in my like likeness. And y'all always hear me talk about this whole idea of the imago day. But well, that's what it is. That we are all created in the image of God. And so when just to get a little history lesson, so blackness, race as we know it, did not already exist, right? And then of course. Then you have th these folks that's coming from Africa and stopping all the way in Haiti and Jamaica and all that on, and until they got to the eastern shore of uh, the eastern shore of uh, of these what we call the United States uh, in Jamestown, Virginia, and Georgia, and South Carolina, and North Carolina, Maryland, uh, all of that, uh, and then you know before that you had Brazil because. The most black people other than Africa in this in, in this country or in this world live in Brazil, but not in America. You would think, oh, because everybody around you is black around you, that America must have to know. We are only 13 percent of this country. But in Brazil, Brazil has the most uh, black people in existence from the African continent other than Africa. Right. And they got there because of the slave trade. They got there because of all of that, you know? And so I said all of that because that this, this, this whole idea of individual moralistic, uh, things that, uh, that we capture in this country has, has a history in terms of how it has befallen black and brown people, right? That they relegate us to groups, but they relegate themselves to individuality. Okay, and so even though the history of this country, mass murderers have been mostly what we would call your European Americans, <laughs> right? If I'm an African American, they are European Americans. The only people that are indigenous to America is the Native American. All right, so they're European Americans, what you would call white folks, right? And African Americans, what you would call black folks, right? And so, but they assigned to us a sense of community when they were judging us negatively. Right. So if one person did it, it was all of us bar that most of that the crime and the mass crime that happened in this country happens by them, that not by us. But when you notice when it happens with them, they try to say, well, that person is mental. They got a psychological situation. They try to give you a whole journey of that person while that why they are different than the than them, than the rest of them. But when someone does it in our community, they assign a sense of community. You see that you never hear about white crime. You hear about black crime and black crime, cl crime is to d place another, again, definition on all the people. But again, they don't do that for themselves. And the reality is, the reality is that, that America has been framed by this whole individualistic concept that Euro-Americans see about themselves. Right. And so I'm doing this. I'm, it's about me. It's about my capitalism, about my business. And I mean, if you study it even through in the history, you're like, whoa, okay. Not even understanding, not even understanding that, you know, one person can do something. And if other people grab along, the success of that thing was because of other people, right? That, that it, and, and, and hear me, y'all. It's partly the notion why, um, uh, we can't gather and they not be unnerved. That, that, and you, you see what I'm saying? 
that every every night or uh, every night, especially during high school uh, sports season, football season, that I pass the Publix in my neighborhood, and you got a bunch of cars, a bunch of motorcycles of of, of young uh, uh, Euro American students being there, white American students being there, uh, there, and no police, no nothing around, right? But if if black young people did that, there will be a police presence trying to break it up because it's in the mind and the notion, right? Because individualism, you know, and, and they wouldn't break it all up. If something happened, they would take that individual because in their mindset, they have a sense of individualized thinking and, I, and their mindset concerning us that we don't. We don't, Right. And, and and everything is etched in that individualized understanding in the context, and we have in our community has have adopted that. It's me, myself, and I. Me, my this, and I gotta have this. My it's my 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 me 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 me. Right? It's a whole selfish context. And the bad part about it that is is that that's not how God designed us to function. And even though they relegated the communal sense to us, well, guess what? That's how we were supposed to be recognized as a people, right? This is what the uh, uh, the the, uh, the the voice of God spoke to Abraham. Abram at the time, he says, "Listen, I'm going to make you a great people." He doesn't rec- he doesn't recognize Abraham as an individual. When he sees Abraham, he sees Abraham as a people. As a matter of fact, when we pray, we say the God of Abraham, what? The God of Isaac and who? The God of Jacob. We place them in a communal sense, don't we? We do, right? That's why we are big on our ancestors. That's why we are big on our foreparents. Community has always been a part of who we are uh, as as African people, African Americans in particular, right? And then when 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 they saw power in community, they started demonizing community, right? That ancestor worship and all that kind of stuff. Those are not notions that come from us. Those are notions that come from their ideology and their hermeneutic and their theology, right? Because these people are finding strength from somewhere to do, to overturn our systems, to overturn our our institution, to outlive our violence, to outlive our vitriol, right? And so, you know, one of the worst things that we can do is, yes, in a sense, embrace community. I know sometimes it is used against us, but we need to recapture the essence and redefine community on our terms, period. That's what we need to do. And it's not a hard thing. It's not a hard thing at all. You know, that yes, we need to create a network. We need to create collaborations, Right. And I told you, historically, when we function in a sense of community, integrity, character, our economy changes, our education changes. Right. All of that. And that and that unnerves the system. Not not all white folks, but that unnerves the system and the institution of whiteness. That's what it does. Culture call. That's what it does. Ask the folks at Tulsa. Ask Seneca Village in New York where that that they that they uh, took folks, the black folks out of that neighborhood and now it's Central Park. That was a black neighborhood, right? <laughs> Ask the folks from Lake Lanier. That was a black neighborhood that they flooded. Ask the folks in Rosewood in Florida. Yeah, every time, and I mean, every time there was a sense of connectivity and community and, and taking care of ourselves, the outsiders came in and got nervous about us getting together. And so sometimes that, that there is something about our community essence that shakes this country, the very fabric thereof. And we have to understand that, right? That the essence of every all the change came out of the sense of the community. You know what that community was called in the 50s and the 60s? You know what it was called? The black church. That was the epicenter of the community, right? That was the moral gauging and that was the character development of the African-American community, the black church. And now we, we have relegated the black church to churches that are prosperity churches, you know, pro- preaching prosperity gospel, the preacher is only for himself and all the X, Y, Z. Wait, that's not how your pastor is. You're adopting language that has absolutely nothing to do with your reality, right? 
your pe- your your preacher buried grandmama, your mama, your granddaddy, your daddy, your children, all that. And so, yeah, real, because that was the sense of community. But now we looked on the outside and they got to demonize. They demonize our preachers. They demonize our pastors. They demonize our teachers. They demonize our businessmen and to, to break up the sense of community. To break up the sense of community. I hope you hear what I'm saying. I know you are. Yeah, that's the facts of the matter. And so, and so, what, what are you calling for, L? What are you saying, Bishop, on this day? Glad that you asked me. Glad that you did. I am saying unto you, we have to re-engage and get a renewed sense of community. A renewed sense of our moral development. We've got to, again, go back to the sense of, guess what? We've got to let the, the neighborhood rear our children as well. We've got to let our neighbors know, hey, let them babysit our kids. Yeah, know who they are. Now, don't know their character and their nature because, you know, people are crazy. I get it. People are coming with some interesting vices, and we don't want to expose our little children to people who are undelivered in their own selves, in their own being. No, I'm not saying that. But there's got to be a sense of moral responsibility connected to the other, connected to the people in our community, in your neighborhood, at your school. Get to know the teachers. Get to know the principal. And I'm not just talking about as the principal and just as the teacher, but people who are vital to the growth of the community and your family. Absolutely. I remember all of my teachers. uh, I remember all of the students. I remember all of my principals, right, because they were a part. My mother and my grandmother, a lot of them went to school together, you know. And, you know, I I, I, I didn't even know that, you know, the school that I went to, an elementary school, was an all-white school, and they moved the school further north to another to, to another place so that they wouldn't have to go to school. I, know, I didn't know all of that growing up because they didn't teach us that. But so the school that I went was predominantly black. And majorly the integration there that they had in the school in the 70s when I when I started school was, you know, the integration, the height of integration was a few, maybe few white students and, and teachers were white. Right. And so and so but but I grew up in that sense of community. Everybody looked like me. And that that again began to develop a certain ethic when everybody looked like me. Then I got to embrace that one of my favorite teachers, Miss Cotrere, right? She had a daughter named Martha that came back to teach. Uh, she was a white woman, just a sweet woman. I mean, my first, second grade teacher, and I got to be in her daughter's class. I used to love, love her daughter, Martha Cotrere. Yeah. And then I started, as a young boy, I started gleaning the sense that, yeah, it's not just my color. We can, we there's something different about people who treat each other with shared humanity. That's character development because everybody everybody doesn't look like you. Everybody's not going to be like you. Now, as a part of my adult life, I've chosen uh, to be a part of HBCUs. That's just my wheelhouse. Shout out to all the HBCUs, Stillman, FAMU, all of y'all who listen out there. If you went to HBCU, shout out to you. Right, cool. Nothing, nothing against Bama, nothing against uh, any other school in, in the state or whatever that, you know, that's no that's just my wheelhouse so i went to famu uh i went to my master's virginia union i'm getting my phd at hampton you know and those were decisive choices because of life purpose that i feel like my life purpose is to develop a sense of community and a sense of theology ecclesiology around my folks black and brown folks that's 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 what i believe that is my wheelhouse in this season of my life i'm not anti anyone but I think that for my life's work, um, that is my that is where I'm supposed to be, right? Uh, so you can definitely have a sense of community that helps develop certain things and have a perspective that we are all equal humans. We are all equal humans. That without standing, without any argument, we I mean we can we can we can go back and say all life, all life, all human life started in the continent of Africa. In the African continent, all all European, everything, all of the they they flowed out of the African continent, right? If they did a DNA test, yeah, that's what. And so and so, all of us have a sense of connection, 
And what are you saying? That America says that in its creeds, it says that in its constitution, it says that in its Bill of Rights, it says that in its Declaration of Independence, but its praxis, in its practice, it doesn't do it. In its practice, it's every man for himself, God for us all. It's, it's well, mm, I don't know. No, we got to be better than that. We have to be better than that. And it's going to take a matured people to do that. And ones that know how to embrace. It takes development, maturity, things of that nature. As long, I believe, as humanity lives, as long, I believe so, there will always be racial animus. And me, me now, me, you don't have to agree with me at Culture Call, but me, I think it's somewhat jealousy and insecurity and not on our part. I, I, I mean, we are people that can do so many things organically. Cook, the rhythm is on our side. You know, our, listen to how we sing. Listen to how we express ourselves. We are the drivers of culture. It is what it is. I mean, and that's not to put anybody on. And not only that, I think what is impressive about our community is that we share our culture. We share our culture. We'll start a thing and 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 share it with everyone else. Our people take it and then act like we didn't have anything to do with it. That's not on us, though. That's on them. We should have to gatekeep who we are, you know, and oh, and, and and who we how we express ourselves. In order for you to say, yo, that came from them. It's just like the inventions. Most of the inventions were, were done by slaves and those kinds of people. But when it came to patents, right? When it came to patents, then they took it. You see? And so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, 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 the history of our country with regards to who we are. And, and our children need to know that, that yes, Son, I'm raising you with a sense of community. I'm raising you a sense of respect. I'm raising you with a sense of understanding who you are and who you belong to. And I'm raising you with a sense of moral integrity so you know how to treat other people. You know how to treat neighbors. You know how to respect your teachers. You know how to respect those in administration. When, a, when an adult talks to you, say yes, ma'am. Say yes, sir. You know, let it become a part of the fabric of who you are because that's building what? Community, right? When I grew up, the old, older, older folks were like, and you would answer them, they ask you a question, and they say, and you say, yeah, well, yeah. And they say, yeah. And they say, yeah. And you say, yeah. Yeah, yeah what? Yeah, what? Yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. And listen, if you don't get it right, you, your mom and your dad didn't have to be there. That person you were talking to would pop you and say, hey, no, when you talk to me, you say yes, sir. They were teaching us respect, you know? And now we got a generation that pushes back on that. I don't care how old you are. I'm a, no, 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 You know, I'm, no, 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 no. Because we, uh, even, e even when I was dealing and leading young people, or uh, older people, I still had to address them as yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Now, ma'am. Now, what we're not going to do is, okay, here is the deal, you know, because what? It's training for community. And we've got to begin to think about what kind of citizen we want. Yes, that's why I'm big on this election and voting, because we've already seen this movie before in 2016 to 2020. We've already seen it. We've all, And the fact that you've got a great swath of the people here. In Alabama that want that again tells you something. A great millions of people in the country want that again. Think that he's been given a bum deal in a, in a rough time because he's being adjudicated. He's being found out for who he is. They, they need to go back and see what he said when he was a Democrat. Mm-hmm. They need to go back and see what he said about them when he was a Democrat. That if he ever ran for president, he would run as a Republican. And he tells you why. Right? We need, a, there's a sense of, of understanding that must be garnered in this generation that right now, 
that if we don't really do our due diligence in our homes, in our communities, listen, this generation is going to, we're going to, we're going to go to the ancestors and this generation will have to fend for itself in a, in a way. And then we can't fight from them. We can't educate them. Then we can't say, Hey, you're doing the wrong things. Then they can only move by what we've given them. So then why don't we give them a sense of moral compass now? A sense of righting wrong. Right? I'm working on something, you know, uh one of my pastor friends were asking me why why am I why am I pro choice in the abortion question? And I said, Well no 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 please let me my my you know, I, life dwells in nuance. I'm anti abortion as it relates to me and my wife and my family. But I'm pro-choice because I want you to choose what you would do, right? But Holy Spirit, God really began to move and began to talk to me and said, hey, okay, if that's the case, then develop something that says you're pro-life. Develop a program. Develop an adoption agency. Develop foster care. Develop, there are people in your church that can't have children. Uh, uh, develop something with, with the local hospitals that, if uh, if they find themselves their mother or or the the uh, Planned Parenthood clinics and say hey if you want if you make a decision to keep your child hey there's a church you can partner with that they're they're looking for children people in their families and their church families look are looking for children hey here's an alternative because sometimes we are the alternatives but we would rather function in vitriol we'd rather function in oh it's wrong it's sin and murdering innocent lives. Well, we already see that that doesn't matter in America. It doesn't. The only reason why they do that is because the baby has the perception, their perception of of innocence. Right? That that baby has the perception of innocence. So, yeah, that part. And so as as and so God has really challenged me to do that. And not only me, I'm going to challenge every church to do that. If you are anti, if you are anti-abortion, if you are pro-life, well, I don't like that because that doesn't pan out. But if that develop programming as an alternative that matches what you say you believe. Because God really put it in my heart. He said, listen, you can be pro-choice because, yes, it is people's choices. And no, I don't want the government in that choosing a righteous choice. But you've got to begin now to put some meat on the bones of your own decision. So that if you believe in this, then you need to create a program that looks like that. You know, otherwise, you're just talking out the side of your neck. Absolutely. Listen, I got to take a break. I know I gave you all a lot just now, but I need you to stay right here on the Culture Call. Praise 93.3790 WTSK with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith. And we are back right here on the Culture Call, having a wonderful conversation about morality and community development and how we will, or how we are focusing on, that's what I want to say, how we are focusing on making our communities better. You know, uh, I've talked to you about the importance of voting and the importance of self-development such that you can present a better, your whole self, a total self, uh, to plugging into relationships. And, uh, and as I was thinking about that, I, I also want to, as we round out and shape out the end of this show today, I want to talk about in, in part and in measure how we can, as people, uh, make this intergenerational context, which means that as we look forward, we have to make sure that we are anchored behind us, that what we have been taught, we've got to admit some things to ourselves, some things have not unfortunately been taught to us properly you know and that could be you know for a lack of proper parenting right some people were not parented properly they didn't just they didn't you know the parents didn't just do what they were supposed to do in terms of you know making certain uh that uh they had the 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 proper training to be good citizens to be good people uh, maybe they didn't have a, a foundation of faith in ethics and morality too. Yes, find out what I am supposed to be doing and guess what, what I'm not supposed to be doing. Um, maybe maybe uh, they found themselves in a situation of abuse or a situation of ho- uh, disownership, homelessness. Homelessness doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a home 
on one instance, it, it, it does mean that. But in a greater sense, it means you have no one who takes you in and shelters you and, and develops you. Like you could have lived with somebody, but they didn't even, you know, that house didn't feel like a home. You had a house to go to, but you didn't have a home for development. But whatever the case may be, we need to begin to look behind us and to see and compare and to contrast, you know, all of the things that we were taught, what we learned, what we gleaned, and be willing to admit to ourselves, yeah, when it comes to really being a prime proponent of community, um, what, what, what do I bring to the table? What have, what have I been taught that I can impart to someone else, right? I think that's very important. You know, in every community, I remember growing up that we had people who were what I would consider to be outliers of the community. That when I say outliers, they were what we considered to be people that you didn't want them to show up at the community party and all those things. You know, they were drunk or strung out on drugs and other issues and all of that. And and one of the things that I noticed, especially from my dad, you know, that there was not anybody too strange that he didn't invite his community. Now, my mom didn't like it. She was like, Joseph, why are you bringing these people around the children, around our house, blah, blah, blah. And they would never come in. They would sit outside and d- daddy would talk to them and they, you know, share a drink or something like that or whatever, you know. Uh, but but a sense of community that my dad never met a stranger, And I think that was out of him looking backwards, like I'm telling you to do, to see how it felt from as a child, a young boy, not experiencing that profound sense of connection in his own life, in his own relationships. I think that that's something that's very, that we don't understand that sometimes people can lack something. And because of that lack, that overwhelming sense of lack, They don't know how to what? Give it to anybody else because you can't give out of an empty wagon. So, yeah, I want you to be a a vibrant part of the community, but that's difficult. That's a difficult ask when you've never really been a part of any kind of community. You could have been the black sheep of your family. You're, you know, you could have been that one that be like, "Mm, okay, you know, and, and how do you, how do you teach community? How do you exemplify? How do you plug in? When you've never felt that you've been a part of a community. Um, and yet, and yet you have responsibility, especially if you're an adult, right? That our foreparents and those who are behind us did the best they could do with what they had. And even if they didn't do the best that they could do with what they had, they gave us what they gave us. And our question is not to indict them or our resolve is not to indict them for what they did and or they did not do. Our now obligation to ourselves is to how can I take the little bit that I'm given or how can I flesh out what was taught to me and keep the good stuff, eat the meat, throw away the bones and build a better life for me and those who will come after me, right? You know, let, let's not be 30, 40, 50, 60 and hold our parents who are probably, who are maybe still here and some are gone to the indictment of what they did, did not give you, they didn't teach you, they didn't train you, how they made you feel. Uh, that, those are very real feelings. But at some given point, you've got to take responsibility of yourself. You got to take responsibility for what you are going to do and how you're going to live your life and what you're going to bring. And if you don't know, if you'd ever had that sense of community, then here's what you do. Seek to be a part. You can do this at a fraternity, a sorority, church, you know, another organization. You can make a friend on your job, you know, that all those things that you didn't, you feel like you may not have had. Yes. Because what you're doing when you refuse that is you refuse or you reject a sense of knowingness and a sense of growth in your own self. You, you, you say, well, hey, I am the product of a dysfunctional system and I guess I'm just going to remain dysfunctional all of my life. 
What I found out from, you know, my dad when he was talking to those drunks uh, and those, you know, those people on, on our front porch, is he would say, everybody want to feel wanted. Nothing deep, nothing profound. But, it, uh, you know, in terms of, but it wasn't deep, but it was profound. It was everybody wants to feel wanted. Nobody, nobody wants to feel like they're not connected. And maybe that, that their, their isms, their habits, their, what we laugh at them about or shun them for might be because of what they're lacking and they're dulling the pain or trying to forget by utilizing, you know, substances and, and doing certain things because they've never had a sense of persons who would care for them and who would love them. That's something to think about. And if we don't think about that, and I said that because you can't have a, a total community without regarding even those who are marginalized or disenfranchised. Jesus would. Jesus did. Yes, he did. And it upset people the way that Jesus built community. Uh-huh, did. He would get with those people and, and folks that he must be a sinner because he's hanging out with these kind of folks. He's hanging out with the drunkards. He's hanging out with the publicans, the tax collectors. He's hanging out with, with the, the sinners. And so he must be a sinner. No, that's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I set up the banquet hall and I called all my father's children. I called all the folks that were supposed to come that should have come to community, but they didn't too preoccupied with their own individuality. They didn't have time. And so when I found that you weren't coming, I sent my servant back out and says, tell them whosoever will, let them come. Go into the hedges and the highways and, and the byways and find those and compel them to come. There's space for them in community. There's space for them at the table. And I don't think sometimes we think about that. You know, that the homeless, those who are again walk around as the marginalized in our community, the 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 you know the spots and what we call our love feast, the nets to our picnics and the ants, we don't we don't understand those sense senses of that maybe that person just wants to feel wanted. Maybe that's what maybe maybe yeah. Um, and and one of the things that we've got to do is develop this sense of urgency. Because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. I don't care how much we exercise, we take medicine, we go to the doctor. Yeah, I don't care how tomorrow is not promised to any of us. And what 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 would the community's reaction be if today was your last time on the earth? Yeah, would the community feel hurt? Would they mourn because a valuable part of the community is now gone? Or would they treat it as, oh, well, okay, well, you know, I didn't really know them. They didn't really, not, they, they, they didn't make themselves known. They didn't really come to anything. They weren't really a part of anything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have to start thinking about that because I think as, you know, as I am in this part of my life, I've always been a part of something. Now, now please, truth be told, I love, I love me time. That I, that I, I do. I enjoy being with myself as well. But I do understand that the, the way that I grow is not simply when I'm in my own meditation or my own thoughts or my own this or my own that. My, my sense of growth comes from the understanding that, uh, yeah, I need to be a part of community. I need to be a part of people. I need to be around people. I need to, I need to be able to look at them and, and, and learn and, and glean and, and look, watch this. And when I say learn and glean, Learn what not to do by being in community. That's what Anatole Appleport says. That's how you can tell the moral uh, essence and the moral development of a man when they when you see them function with a sense of community. When you see them function within community. When you see them around people at the party, at the at the church gathering, at the church. When you see them at the meeting. Then you can tell what people are really about. You can tell what where their ups and their downs are. You can tell how they're really doing in life, right? Beyond the clicks and the 
emo- emojis that we send each other telling us, telling each other we, fi- we feel fine. We can't really adjudicate that until you get in community because when your presence becomes a part of a community, you give off a vibration. Don't get spooky. It is what it is. You give off a bri- vibration. We can tell, really tell by your face, by your actions, by the half smile. We can ask a question, one simple question that provokes tears in your eyes. Yeah. When you're in the community. When you come from behind the screen and allow your person to be vulnerable in the midst of other people. Then we will find the essence about of what you're about, what you're thinking. Yeah. That's what I believe that is. And if we don't do that. We sorely miss an opportunity, an opportunity to be fully vibrant and fully brilliant in who God has made us to be. That's how I learn people, to be around them. Yeah. What's funny, sometimes people think I'm always talking and always that cheerful, encouraging one. No, but sometimes I've learned the most by being an observer of people. And I know some of you culture call are the same way that I am. I don't do all the talking. I let them talk. (laughs) <laughs> I let them chatter, chatter, chatter. And then I just watch. I watch and then and then I'll gravitate to a, a few people and say, hey, what's going on? I've been watching you X, Y, Z. Hey, you okay? You sure you're okay? You enjoying yourself? How's life treating you? X, Y, Z. And, and, and cause, because that's what Jesus did. He kept walking and going around and says, hey, what's going on here? Won't thou be made whole? You know, how long has he been this way? Where are your accusers? Where is your husband? It's that sense of building community that people begin to discover authenticity. And I hope today that we've allowed ourselves to explore what that really means for us, our morality and and our moral development, rather, in being a part of the community. I hope I've encouraged you to come out of your silos, come out of your corners, your secret places, and develop community. Because that's the thing that's going to move you forward in life. Yeah. I see the runway, y'all, but we got a little bit more to go. I need you to keep it right here on the Culture Call with yours truly, L. Smith Smith. Don't you go nowhere. This is the world premiere. And we have had a wonderful day today, family. Don't you agree? I'm telling you. I have had a blast just sharing with you some of my thoughts on how we can build a better community and how... We can utilize the tools and the instruments that God has made us to be to make our neighborhoods better, our families better, our marriages better, our communities better, our state and our world better. I believe that you cannot do that without people. And I think that is very important for us to understand and recognize that God put us here for a reason. And that reason, that reason, yes, is a part of the whole idea that you know, hmm, maybe I, I, you and I have a responsibility to each other that goes beyond words, that goes beyond mere uh, greetings. Hey, what's up, man? What's going on, sis? You know, what's all? Yeah, that goes beyond that, that we are to be what? Building something, constructing something that is viable for the future. And if we refuse to do such, when we don't allow ourselves to be engaged with one another, then you really don't know not just the worst, but even the best that can come out of you. It is in that place of best. It is in that place where we begin to learn and understand and begin to acknowledge and see that, hey, the best elements of who we are are found when we are around people. That we will even find out probably even how to treat ourselves better when we develop community and when we are vibrant with one another. That's so very important. I don't think that we need to disregard that. So every person you see, don't be standoffish. Protect yourself. Yes, guard your heart with all diligence. But out of them flow the issues of life. Make sure that you protect your gate, your ear, your heart, your mouth, all of those things. But while you're in protective services, <laughs> make sure that you open up your heart and your mind to embrace your place in the sense of community, in the 
place where you find value and worth. Because that's the place where we, you will discover yourself as you are helping others discover themselves. Listen, so glad and appreciative that you all have been a part of this show, but don't worry about it. We'll be back tomorrow from 10 to 12. I need you to tell everybody about the culture call. Let them know that we've always got something great to say. Listen, like my grandmama and my mama would say at the end of every phone call, I love your bushel, I love your peck, and I love your hug around the neck. This has been yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on the Culture Call. Praise 93.3, 790WTSK. You all have a blessed day. Love each other and be a part of community. Peace.